In our passage, we have the Pharisees once again coming to Jesus, throwing out test question, trying to see what he's going to claim as the most important. I want to test him on the rules. Those of you who are soldiers in training, over the last few weeks you've learned a lot of rules, haven't you? What would it be like, do you think, if your drill sergeant said, all right, which is the greatest rule we've taught you so far? And you had to pick one out of the air. Would you appreciate that challenge? I don't see a lot of enthusiasm. I want to guess not. You know, it's funny. We've got these rules. We got the, you know, they could have been talking to him about the Ten Commandments. They could have been talking about many of the other rules that are listed in places like Leviticus and Deuteronomy. There's a wide, wide swath of rules out there. Most people consider the rules as things not to do. Don't do this, don't do that. It's funny in our language, we get terms that are used in one way by one group in different ways by different groups. And we see that in, in this, we see that within the church, there's language we use within the church that outside of the church isn't understood. People don't get it. And then if you start breaking down by denomination to denomination, you get particular phrases or terms that are unique to denominations. So you may have two Christians talking to one another and not understanding what the other is talking about. And that, in fact, happened to me one time I was in a big gathering of chaplains, about 40 or 50 people in the room, and the person who was presenting asked the chaplains there, asked each one of us to just stand up and say what your number one goal in life was. An interesting thing, but it was it was the icebreaker, the get to know you moment. And so everyone's getting up and they say what they want to do. And there are a few people that say that they wanted to read the Bible more. There were some people that said that they wanted to pray more. There was a variety of people whose goal was not related to matters of faith. And when it gets to me, he said. What's your goal? And I got up and I introduced myself. And I said, you know, I'm Chaplain Rindall. My goal in life is to live the summary. And the people looked at me and they went from smiling faces because everybody's giving these great answers to kind of blank stares. The summary. What's the summary? You see, I'd used a phrase that was apparently unique to the church that I was in compared to the churches that they represented, they didn't understand that the summary means the summary of the law and prophets. That I wanted to live the summary, meaning I wanted to love the Lord my God with all my heart, with all my strength, and with all my mind. To love my neighbor as myself. Because on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. If you can do these two things, the rest take care of themselves. You have met the entirety of God's will for your life. The summary, a phrase unknown to them, but so important to my understanding. Simultaneously, we have in here, if you're going to understand that, you need to understand the term love. What does love mean? It's interesting, in uh, going to school, we were learning, of course, you got to take this class called hermeneutics, real fancy word for figuring out what the Bible says. All right? And in that class, the professor, he said, what's the word fine mean? One person said it means thin, like fine hair. Another person, 
who was in the process of doing her uh, wedding gift registration, she said, fine silver and fine china. And yet another person said, attractive. See, there's all these different definitions for words. So we've got love now. And what does love mean? Does it mean love as in that emotional contact? Does it mean love as in I love football? Which I don't, just letting you know. Well, love means commitment. Love like love your country, as you obviously do. You've put the uniform on, you've made a commitment that is beyond regular understanding. The majority of the world does not understand why one person would sacrifice on behalf of another. They might understand why you sacrifice for a friend. In fact, Jesus even comments on that in Scripture. But a total stranger? No, I don't get that. That's what the majority of the people you will come in contact throughout your future They'll respect it, won't understand it. That's what we're talking about. Love, commitment. So now we've got our definition. We've got our understanding that the summary is to love God and to love neighbor. And that that means commitment. Cyril of Alexandria, one of those great church leaders, he said, The first commandment teaches every kind of godliness, for to love God with the whole heart is the cause of every good. The second commandment includes the righteous acts we do toward other people. The first commandment prepares the way for the second, and in turn is established by the second. For the person who is grounded in the love of God clearly also loves his neighbor in all things. The kind of person who fulfills these two commandments experiences all of them. So let's look at the commandments. Those ten famous commandments. You shall have no other gods before me. Well, if you love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, you're not going to. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeliness of anything that is in heaven above or in the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. Will you love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength? And you won't. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Well, if you love God, you won't. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Well, if you love God, you have a commitment to what He has told you to do, you will. Honor your father and mother. Well, love your neighbor as yourself, and you will. You shall not murder. Love your neighbor as yourself, and you won't. You shall not commit adultery. Love your neighbor as yourself. And you won't. You shall not steal. Love your neighbor as yourself. And you won't. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Love your neighbor and yourself. And you won't. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his servants or any of his possessions. Well, if you love your neighbor as yourself, you won't. You see, there are things that are identified by God that we're not supposed to do. Ten Commandments give the big general. You go through the scriptures and you find a variety of lists in multiple places. And it gives you things that you're not supposed to do. We understand that. That that's there. But the trouble that this has caused is that many people have come to believe that Christianity is a faith of thou shalt not. And that's looking at our faith the wrong way around. Christianity is a faith of thou shall. As Jesus instructed us, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. 
You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Why? Because on these two commandments, these two things, get these two right. Everything else, all the law, all the prophets, get these two right. They t- the others take care of themselves. You go through your training, you go through life, you're always faced with a list of rules. God gives us two. In all every other list we get, they can all be defined by two. Love God, love your neighbor. In all you do, in every place, wherever you are, in your training, in your future assignments, for those of you who are returning home as part of the reserve or guard and you go on to school or civilian jobs, it doesn't matter where you are. Live the summary. Please God by obeying all of His law and all of His prophets by doing two things. Don't worry about thou shall not. Worry about thou shall. Two things. Love God. Love your neighbor. Everything else will take care of itself. Amen.